What's so important about that though, is realizing that it's some cells, not all cells. The vast majority of the body's cells continue to respond to insulin perfectly fine. But true across all of that definition is that every cell in the body has insulin receptors. Ben Bickman, I am thrilled to welcome you to the Better Podcast. Welcome. Oh, my pleasure, Stephanie. Thank you so much for reaching out. This will be a great conversation. Oh, yes. I When I saw this book, I reached out immediately. I was like, I would love for you to come on the podcast to talk. And we are going to have such a robust conversation today all about insulin resistance, how we can improve uh, our insulin sensitivity, fat cells, weight loss, all the things that can happen, some of the disorders and diseases that can follow uh, insulin resistance. I am thrilled, thrilled to have you here. My pleasure. Yeah, we're going to talk about everything people want to hear and even things they didn't know they wanted to hear about. That's right. That's right. And I wanted to maybe start our conversation just kind of, you know, getting our feet wet a little bit. Uh, I know in your story, um, in your history, you there was a point in your learning when you came across a study that really changed the way that you looked at fat and adipose tissue as a signaling organ rather than sort of this inert um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, benign storage, organ, yeah, storage depot. So maybe we can start with, uh, what that discovery was for you, how that influenced your thinking. And then we can move into a conversation of what fat is, you know, and, and, and maybe more importantly, what it isn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the study that you're referring to, I, I love that you're bringing that up because it's such an appropriate place for me to start in, in addressing how I came to want to focus on insulin and fat cells in the first place. And it really was this, that one moment in the, it was a study published in the late nineties. And I came across it in the early two thousands as a young new graduate student. And it was so revelatory for me because it detailed two fascinating mechanisms. Uh, one that fat cells are actively secreting molecules, proteins, it, hormones and inflammatory proteins that are then influencing the entirety of the body. That was a completely novel uh, finding. Uh, I'd never, it wasn't so novel to see people who knew about fat cells, but for me at that time, it was mind blowing that the fat cells are more, as you said, than just an inert storage depot for energy. It is actively contributing to the endocrine system in the body, sending hormones all around. And then second, the fact that these fat cells were actively secreting pro-inflammatory proteins when the fat cell was getting too big, that started to piece together this, what had been a growing interest of mine, but and also perhaps because it was a growing interest in the scientific community at the time, which was trying to understand the mechanism whereby excess fat causes type two diabetes. And so this finding was that these fat cells were secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines that was causing insulin resistance. And that was the fundamental issue to type two diabetes. That was fascinating to me. And at that moment, it completely changed my trajectory. And when I went on to my PhD research, I studied inflammation. When I went into my postdoctoral research, I studied more of the mechanisms that connect fats and inflammation to insulin resistance. And now, having um, run my own lab, the Metabolism Research Lab, for the past 10 years as a, as a professor, the interest has continued to focus in more and more on insulin resistance, uh, the, the causes of it, in part because the relevance of insulin resistance in chronic diseases just continues to, to grow. The laundry list of diseases that stem from insulin resistance just gets bigger all the time. So that, that was the kind of evolution of my interest, where it started and what put me on the path that I'm, that I'm currently on. And, and again, even now in the midst of, uh, of a pandemic of people fearing this virus, the most relevant pre-existing conditions are, wouldn't you know it, also very relevant to insulin resistance. Right. And I think that that's so important and we can, and I want to, I want to really dive into adipose tissue and what are some things that sensitize the different types, like mm -hmm. the good and the bad types of fat, but just as we're kind of getting ourselves warmed up and making sure that everyone's on, you know, level pegging in terms of their understanding, let's talk about insulin. You've mentioned it. Let's talk about what insulin resistance is. Um, and then I, 
I would love for you to outline. So if we're thinking about a, a person who has normal metabolism, what is the, what is the fate of glucose in someone who is, who is insulin sensitized? And then how does that compare and contrast with what happens to glucose in a resistant insulin resistant person? Okay. Okay. Yeah. These are great questions. So the first one, and, and I'll really attempt to be brief in defining insulin resistance, um, but appreciate the challenge, you know, cause I've devoted my life to this, uh, to understanding insulin resistance, but to say it as succinctly as possible, it really is a disorder of two, two things. Um, the first one is the insulin resistance itself. And that term um, really is invoked at the level of the cell. So by that, I mean, there are some cells in the body, not all cells, but some cells in the body that aren't responding to insulin the same way they used to. They've become resistant to insulin. They have manifested insulin resistance. What's so important about that, though, is realizing that it's some cells, not all cells. The vast majority of the body's cells continue to respond to insulin perfectly fine. But true across all of that definition is that every cell in the body has insulin receptors. Insulin has an effect at literally every cell in the body from bone to brain, liver to lung. It doesn't matter. Every cell in the body is responding to insulin in some way, but with insulin resistance, some cells are compromised in their signaling. That's one side of the coin that we call insulin resistance. But the second side of the coin is often overlooked, but to understand how insulin resistance is so relevant to chronic diseases, we have to appreciate the other side of the coin. And that is hyperinsulinemia. In the body, you do not have insulin resistance unless you concurrently have hyperinsulinemia or elevated blood insulin, chronically elevated insulin. Those two phenomena go together. They, like I said, they are the two sides of the coin that we call insulin resistance. The first side being the compromised insulin signaling at some cells, and the second side being the chronically elevated insulin. And that matters because remember, most of the body's cells are continuing to respond to insulin as well as they ever were, but now they are, they're inundated with the insulin signal and insulin is screaming at them to do too much. And they are a slave to that yelling and they, they, they are overactive that that insulin induced, whatever the insulin signal is telling it to do, the cell must obey. And now it's just doing it much more than it would like. So that's defining insulin resistance. And this will become relevant as we dive into, you know, polycystic ovary syndrome or, or erectile dysfunction, the two most common infertilities in women and men, respectively, each of those are manifesting the different sides of this coin in their different, in, in the different parts of the body. But then to your, the second part of your question is exploring what glucose is doing in someone who's insulin sensitive or someone who's insulin resistant, there is in fact a profound difference in the body's response to glucose. And that's because the muscle is compromised in insulin resistance and muscle is the main consumer of glucose. It is the glucose sink. So if someone's eaten a starchy or sugary meal, 80% of all that glucose is, is gonna be dependent on insulin opening up the glucose doors at the muscles, allowing the glucose to come rushing from the blood into the muscle. So almost all of the glucose will be going into the muscle. If someone is insulin sensitive and they consume a starchy, a starchy sugary meal, the glucose will come up and it will come down quite quickly because the muscle will respond to the insulin load that also comes up and then the glucose will come rushing into the muscle. However, if someone is insulin resistant, Commonly, that means the muscles are insulin resistant. And if the muscles are insulin resistant, now the glucose comes up. Insulin is trying to pound on the doors of the muscle to get them to open the, well, to the, open the glucose doors, so to speak, but they aren't listening. The muscle cells stay closed and the glucose then stays up much, much higher in the body for hours longer than it would in a person who is insulin sensitive. So when we are, so is muscle then the first tissue? So you said that we, when we're talking about insulin sensitization, is it at the myocyte where we start to see changes in insulin sensitivity or do we, or are there other, do we want to talk about what those um, other tissues might be? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And I wouldn't want someone to hear me answer this question and sort of scoff and say, oh, I thought Bickman was an expert on this, but here's the answer. We don't know. 
Uh, we do not know in, in, in uh, any organism, which is the first tissue to become insulin resistant. Right. I will speculate though. And so this will, the person who just scoffed can swallow the scoff because after they hear <laughs> the speculation, they'll probably agree. I, I believe that insulin resistance in most instances, and there could of course be exceptions, but I believe it starts in the fat cell. And basically, and you alluded to this at the outset of the conversation, when someone has elevated insulin and sufficient calories, fat tissue will grow. So right. the person will start gaining fat mass. The belt is getting tight. And if we had, let's imagine two, two fellows, um, they're, they're buddies in college. They're both lean and smug about being lean and brag about their fast metabolic rate, which has nothing to do with being lean, but they don't know that because they're ignorant undergraduates. They graduate, they get old, and they both start gaining weight. They could be gaining weight very differently. And the first fellow may be gaining his weight through what's called hypertrophy, where each individual fat cell is becoming hypertrophic. So he's not making any more fat cells than he had when he was a smug undergrad. It's just each individual fat cell is now getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Indeed, several times bigger, potentially three or four times bigger than another fat cell um, that, you know, or the, the size of the fat cells before. But the insulin and the calories, the sufficient calories are promoting the growth of this fat cell. So again, that's hypertrophic fat growth. His old buddy may be gaining the same amount of weight. They've both been gaining 10 pounds per year. But this guy, his fat cells get a little big and then they recruit a new fat cell. They recruit a new fat cell and that is hyperplastic fat growth or hyperplasia. And in that situation, the fat cells themselves never get too big. But right when they start to grow, they recruit a new fat cell to come help kind of carry the load. In the case of the hypertrophic fat growth, he will start to limit. His fat cells get to a point where they cannot grow anymore. And I'll come back to that in just a sec. And so he will typically stop gaining weight at a certain point. Now, it might be 50 or 60 pounds or so. But in these instances of hypertrophic fat growth, there's a limit. The fat cells reach a limit. In the hyperplastic fat growth, it's almost like the sky's the limit. Anytime they need more energy or to store more energy because insulin's demanding it, a new fat cell will come in and help. So the hypertrophic fat cell has no more room, no vacancy. The hyperplastic fat cells always have more vacancy. They always have more room. Now, in the case of the hypertrophic fat cells, the fat cell gets to a point where it is so big that it now starts to worry about its own survival. And in order to ensure its survival, it does two things. One, it starts to stop listening. It stops listening to insulin. Insulin is trying to tell that fat cell to hold all of its fat in and just keep storing, keep storing, keep storing. Insulin is still able to force feed the fat cell, but insulin is now not able to stop the fat cell from leaking out its fat. So just as it's taking in fat, it's now leaking fat out. So insulin is not able to inhibit lipolysis. So it's become insulin resistant in that regard. And again, it's doing it to prevent it from getting so big that it has reached you know, a, a point of, of actually damaging or, or becoming necrotic. So it's attempting to inhibit its own growth by becoming insulin resistant. So like I said, it's leaking fat, uh, free fatty acids. And that becomes a problem in a moment. I'll, I'll come back to that. And the second problem is all of these fat cells are getting so big, the fat cells themselves are getting further, they're getting pushed further and further from capillaries. And every viable cell needs to be close enough to a capillary to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen and to exchange metabolites. And as the fat cells are getting so big, like I said, they're getting further from capillaries. And so they start to release pro-inflammatory cytokines to try to increase the blood flow. Because many of the pro-inflammatory cytokines are vascular growth factors. They will stimulate the growth of new capillaries. And so this is what the fat cell is doing to survive. It's trying to increase its access to blood and limit its own growth by becoming insulin resistant. And, but in the process, it's leaking free fatty acids and um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And those two become kind of the formula or the recipe that other cells will use to become insulin resistant themselves, like the liver, the muscle, for example, are two key examples because when they become insulin resistant, now the glucose starts to climb. And then with conventional medicine, which is so focused on glucose, we detect the problem. But it was years after the insulin would have been climbing and the body would be, have been 
becoming more insulin resistant. And I, again, I believe it started at the fat cell. Now, part of my reason for believing that is you can give someone who's very type two diabetic, very insulin resistant to the point of type two diabetes, you can give them a drug that will flip the switch in the fat cell, going from a hypertrophic fat cell to a hyperplastic fat cell. And that's a type of drug called a, thi called a, a thiazolidine dione. That's the kind of family of, of drug. And it's what's called a PPAR gamma activator. And when you flip that genetic switch, you basically tell the fat cells, hey, start making more fat cells, recruit to help. And so we have something very kind of paradoxical that happens where we flip the fat cells to become hyperplastic, which means they immediately become more insulin sensitive. And indeed, the person becomes very insulin sensitive very quickly, their glucose levels get better, and the type 2 diabetes starts to get better. But, and again, to the paradox, they start to get fatter and fatter, because we're allowing the cells to start growing. And that's part of the, 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 the ideology here of insulin resistance. And part of the beauty of fat cells, if fat cells can store fat, the person stays healthy. And so that's where we see those rare instances. And I do mean rare, it is not overly common where a person can get to 400, 500 pounds and you're measuring their, their clinical markers and, and they can look okay. They can have reasonably good blood lipids, reasonably good glucose and insulin and even blood pressure. It's because despite that incredible amount of fat, there that is a body that is uniquely capable of storing fat. And so paradoxically, they get very fat, yet maintain relatively good health. But again, that is not common. Most people are on that hypertrophic side of the coin, and they start to gain a little weight, and they start to suffer from that weight. And depending on the ethnicity, it can be more or less apparent. When I did my fellowship in Singapore, um, part of the reason the Singapore government was so interested in having scientists study diabetes was because of the disparity across the ethnicities in Singapore, the Europeans or, or the Caucasians, I, I guess I should say, you know, all of which are, you know, European descent, the Malaysians, the, Ind the Asian Indians and the Chinese ethnicities. If you look across that spectrum, you have this really broad discrepancy, basically of, of who can get the fattest, but stay the healthiest. And the trend across these was that the Caucasian European ethnicity could get fatter and be healthier, whereas the Chinese ethnicity was particularly sensitive to fat changes, where they're gaining just a little bit of fat, the fat cells are growing through hypertrophy much more, and they start to get diabetes and hypertension, for example, at a much lower body fatness than, say, a comparable weight of, of a Caucasian man. Right. And you can see the knock-on effect of that, right? When you have a hypertrophic uh, fat cell, and now it's starting to leak these uh, prone, like these uh, cytokines and this free fatty acids, then that's going to have a knock-on effect on the liver, who's now having to yep. deal with all of the excess substrate that it's receiving. My question to you around that is what is the bifurcation in the road that determines whether someone will engage in hypertrophy of the fat cell where it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, or someone who is, uh, who will have the hyperplasia effect where you're having like the birth of these new cells where mm -hmm. they get a little bit, a little bit bigger, but nothing, uh, where you're seeing this sort of necrosis or this necrotizing effect on the, on the cell. Yeah, yeah, great question. So there's un, undeniably there's a genetic component. There's most certainly uh, something you're born with it, you inherit it. There, there's this uh, one propens uh, propensity for one pathway or the other. And again, most people go to the hypertrophic side of the coin. However, there's also um, uh, uh, an environmental component, uh, namely the consumption of seed oils. This has been fairly well established in isolated culture of, of fat cells, of, of fat cell cultures, you know, like growing, growing in a Petri dish like we do in the lab, in my lab across the hallway here. When these, when fat cells are exposed to linoleic acid, the omega-6, that uh, fat that most people eat nowadays, and that's coming from soybean oil and canola oil and, you know, all of those refined seed oils, those, that fat, linoleic acid, can accumulate within the fat cell and stop hyperplasia and force hypertrophy. So there is, that is an absolutely relevant lifestyle variable. And I, I emphasize it because someone listening to this would think naively, well, I don't eat soybean oil, so it's fine. That's not my problem. You probably do, you unfortunately. probably do, yeah. Yeah, soybean oil 
in particular, has become the single most common source of fat in the Western diet. And this was well identified in, in through studies at the NIH here in the U.S. And, and people want to people want to kind of t throw shade on the U.S. But I've given talks on this topic literally around the world, including in the Middle East and in Asia. And I would bet per calorie they eat at least as much of, of these seed oils than 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 in the U.S. and in India as well, where there's such an an eschewing of any animal fats in some instances that ends up shifting very, very powerfully to these seed oils. And tragically, of course, people are told those are healthy. You ought to be cooking with these. But the real truth is, at least in the context of fat cells, that individual fat is resulting in fat cells that only grow through hypertrophy. And now you have lit the fuse for insulin resistance. Right. And just for the listener, linoleic acid, this is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, correct? So this means that it has all like mostly unsaturated bonds, which are highly oxidizable. So when you are able to, uh, this is going to, like you were saying, it's going to disrupt the fat cells ability to proliferate. And it's also going to cause rampant inflammation, right? So this is the yeah. other, and inflammation is a little bit, it's kind of like pain. It's like, what does that even mean? You know, but inflammation is this sort of, you know, glow, like this global, um, you know, when we talk about pathways, we're going to be activating these like pro-inflammatory pathways, the cytokines and the, um, you know, all these pro-inflammatory pathways that are going to cause just like metabolic chaos, like it's going to cause mayhem there. Um, and we can talk a little bit about if you wanted to maybe touch on in your, in your book, you talked about sort of these like mean fats, like you, one of them, uh, is for HNE or for hydroxy. Yep. Uh, not at all. And that is from, that is from the, like the sort of the marriage of just what you were saying, the linoleic acid or these polyunsaturated fatty acids and reactive oxygen species, which happens when you have a unstable, when you have this instability in the, in the chemical bonding, correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So I, I kind of point a finger at two fats in particular that make the fat cells grow through hypertrophy that kind of limit its possibility for hyperplasia. And one you noted is, is this, this metabolite of linoleic acid called 4-hydroxynonenol, 4-HNE. That is the actual where the rubber meets the road molecule that limits the, the proliferative capacity of the fat cell forcing hypertrophy. Another one is a, a molecule called ceramide 1-phosphate. And, and that's a totally different class of fat, but it is stimulated into production in the wake of chronically elevated insulin as one cause and inflammation itself. Inflammation will trigger the, the synthesis of the ceramide family of molecules, and then ceramide 1-phosphate would be one of those fats. So when people, uh, people will commonly want to say fat causes insulin resistance, this is especially... Um, touted among low fat kind of plant-based, even, even vegan, vegan circles, they'll say, well, fat is fat causes insulin resistance and saturated fat causes it even more. And part of that, part of them saying that is it is based on some truth, partly through the mechanisms I just mentioned, like the ceramide mechanism mechanism in particular, that's something I've studied a great deal, the synthesis of ceramides and the process whereby these fats called ceramides actually block a cell's ability to respond to insulin. And ceramides are built on a backbone of saturated fat. And so people will, they say this, and there's a speck of truth to that. However, the whole argument falls apart, unfortunately, when you then take it to the whole body, which is what happens when someone eats saturated fat. And the reality is, based on studies in humans, if you are limiting the carbohydrates, they can be eating three times more saturated fat than the low fat group. And their actual amount of circulating saturated fat will be lower. And so there's this paradox, this disconnect, where someone sees this ounce of a, a paper, indeed, e even some of my own manuscripts that I've published on this topic, where the saturated fat palmitate is a necessary part of the production of ceramides. And they will say, oh, well, palmitate's a saturated fat, so we need to avoid all saturated fats, and animal fats have saturated fats. Now, that's not entirely fair to animal fats, of course, because they have a mix of all kinds of fats. But nevertheless, they take that one phenomenon and then naively and even um, incorrectly apply it to the whole body. And that's where the whole thing falls apart. When someone, what we need to ask is 
what happens in those studies where someone is eating more saturated fat? Do they get worse? And, and is, the answer is if carbohydrates are low, they don't. Uh, indeed, they get better and their circulating saturated fats actually go down. And that's just because the liver is so good at making its own saturated fats. If insulin is up, the liver is very, very busily pumping out the saturated fat palmitate like, like gangbusters. It becomes a palmitate producing factory. Right. So what, what I'm hearing you, what I'm hearing you say is that context matters, right? So this is, you yeah. know, the nuance of human biochemistry is that, and it's, we see it all the time in nutrition. Like there's this sort of dogma in nutrition. It's like, you're either crazy if you're vegan or you're crazy if you're not, or there's these, it's, it's almost religious in a way, mm -hmm. but in a low insulin environment, what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but in a low insulin environment, the consumption of saturated fat is not going to produce these um, drivers of this hypertrophic fat cell that when we have a low and maybe there's some production of these ceramides. Um, but when we compare that to an environment where someone might be eating, where there's a high insulin environment, and of course you can, you know, very easily deduce that they're eating more carbohydrates because that is the big stimulator of, uh, an insulinergic spike, uh, in a high carbohydrate or high insulin environment, you're not going to be producing these ceramides. You're not going to be producing these toxic inf pro inflammatory, um, uh, signal signals and fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In indeed. Even in that same study I just mentioned where they were eating about three times more saturated fat in the low carb group compared with the low fat group, the actual markers of inflammation were, were down. These prototypical markers like TNF alpha or interleukin one beta were, were significantly lower, all the more adding to this, what I consider the true paradigm, which is as long as carbs are in control, which is why to me, the first rule of a dietary intervention is controlling carbohydrates, then the fat you're eating is far less relevant. Right. Let, let's move to some of the early signs of insulin resistance. One of the things I love that you said in the book is that insulin, you don't just like wake up with type two diabetes. It's this you know, cumulative sort of snowball that's kind of rolling, going down the mountain. And as it you know, develops inertia and you know, it's harder to stop, but what happens initially, your description was that you may have, when we look at glucose, um, it, you may be euglycemic, meaning that you have, you know, when you take uh, blood pan, like their blood glucose looks normal, but it could also be true simultaneously that this patient or this person is pumping out, you know, large amounts of insulin in order to keep that, um, that euglycemic environment. So there are some things that you outlined in the book that I thought were phenomenal and just on point. And I wanted to talk about some of these early signals. You'd mentioned fertility. We can maybe double click on that. Um, just before we do, I would love for you to touch on migraines because this is, this was so, I loved how you laid this out. Well, how can migraines be an early possible early warning sign that you are insulin resistant or developing that? Yeah. Yeah. Migraines is one of those disorders that someone would never think is relevant uh, to insulin resistance. And yet people who experience migraines, uh, there was a study I highlighted very recently on social media where when you give someone a migraine, uh, when some, you take two groups, no headaches and migraine sufferers, you give them an equal load of glucose and the migraine sufferers, their insulin in response to that glucose will go twice as high as the insulin does in the non-migraine control group. So there's clearly a disruption in insulin signaling in these individuals, not to mention a, a, a fasting difference where their fasting insulin is, is about, four, uh, about 70 percent 70 higher or so than in the non-migraine control group. The, the mechanisms I can only speculate on, the connection appears to be there. Um, we find, have a very strong correlation, but that, is, of course, does not establish causality. The two mecha mechanisms that I think could explain whereby insulin resistance is causal to migraines would be one due to a fuel disruption where the insulin resistance is affecting the brain and now the brain isn't getting enough of its energy. It can't get enough glucose to meet its energetic needs. And two, the hyperinsulinemia is affecting the brain's blood vessels in a, a unique way that is making them excessively dilated. And so the brain is basically flush with too much blood, creating a physical pressure 
because where you have more blood, you have a higher blood pressure. That might sound like a good thing to have more blood, but in a finite space like the skull, you can't really muck around with volume changes too much without there being profound consequences. And so the pressure goes up dramatically as the blood flow expands and giving rise potentially to the migraine. So migraine is one of those potentially early signs. Not always, it's possible someone could have migraines and have no speck of insulin resistance, but the, the trends are most certainly there to, to at least point a finger preliminarily. And I would say if someone's experiencing migraines, uh, try some, some dietary changes to improve your insulin sensitivity and your glucose control. And I wouldn't be surprised if the migraines start to resolve. Yeah, that's great. What are, let, let's talk a little bit about fertility. We've talked, we've kind of been circling around and I want to talk a little bit about it now. Um, PCOS in women, most common um, you know, hormonal disorder, I would say by far in terms of uh, absolute numbers, it's rooted. I think it, at least the women I work with, it's rooted in hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance. So let's talk a little bit about PCOS in women and ED uh, erectile dysfunction in men and how those can be related to IR insulin. Resistance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I say yep, IR because yep. that's how I write it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get the, I get the acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with, with polycystic ovary syndrome, in, in fact, I have a, I have a, a friend here in, in Utah who is a fertility doctor, and he, when he talks about PCOS with his patients, he does not describe it as PCOS. He says you have metabolic infertility, and I love that term because it is a more, I believe it's a more accurate description where overwhelmingly, if a woman has polycystic ovary syndrome, it's because of an underlying hyperinsulinemia, which of course itself is going to be, you know, part of this um, constellation of insulin resistance. And, and the mechanism is really fascinating. In the ovary, there are a group of cells uh, called theca cells. And theca cells are not the cells responsible for making the eggs or the follicles that will become the eggs. They're responsible for making the sex hormones. And what's neat about what the theca cells do uh, is that they convert the, uh, they convert testosterone, you know, the prototypical androgen into the estrogens, that little family of, of hormones that we call estrogen sometime, but I refer to it in plural, estrogens. So there's an enzyme that mediates that conversion, and that's an enzyme called aromatase. And that's how it's working all the time. And it's supposed to work. And in order to ovulate, it needs to be very active. And a woman will have an a spike in estrogens, and, and then she will ovulate. But that big estrogen spike is a necessary event in normal in the normal ovulatory or menstrual cycle. However, when insulin is really high, it starts to inhibit aromatase, that enzyme that was converting the androgens to estrogens. It gets ramped, uh, it, it gets ramped down or tamped down, tapped down, and now she's she's waiting. The ovaries are attempting to convert the androgens and, and simply cannot. So she fails to get that estrogen spike which means no ovulation, which is bad enough, but to add insult to injury, she's also, she also has ovaries that are now releasing too many androgens. And so we have on one hand, the failure to ovulate, which means all of those follicles each month just stick around in the ovary and then stick around for another cycle and another cycle getting bigger and bigger and more and more painful potentially. But we also have, like I said, the insult to injury, which is the higher androgens are potentially giving her male pattern baldness, potentially giving her more coarse body hair and facial hair, arm hair, armpit hair, et cetera, and even acne, like you would expect to see in like a young teenage boy um, or just a teenager in general. So these are all of those um, alterations in sex hormones are causing all of the symptoms that she's experiencing. But if we go one layer deeper, in virtually every instance, that was itself a fundamental result of the elevated insulin. Now, someone listening to this might think, well, I have a sister who has PCOS and she's lean. She's not overweight, like you'd typically think of in someone who has PCOS. She doesn't fit the profile. Even in lean women with PCOS, you can actually, there's a study that was published that detected that the fat cells were significantly more insulin in those lean women compared with equally uh, women of equal weight who did not have PCOS. So the insulin resistance gets more fundamental. Um, it, it is more fundamental than most people think. And even when someone doesn't fit the profile, it's still relevant in a woman who has PCOS. And even one last point on that, 
part of the, the, the relevance of insulin resistance, I think, is reflected in the fact that so many women with PCOS respond well to uh, metformin, which is an insulin sensitizing medication. That is its mechanism of action. And most women will leave a doctor's office with a prescription for metformin at some point in their PCOS treatment, or alternatively, change your diet to lower the insulin, break that insulin resistance cycle. And there is a little bit of evidence to suggest that's going to solve the problem. Yeah. And, you know, if you're listening to this, you know, if you remember, we've done a lot of podcasts on the menstrual cycle and the norm, you know, what the normal cadence looks like there is, you know, in the week before ovulation, estrogen can go from, you know, call it five picograms per milliliter all the way up to like three, four, 500. Like there is a huge sp uh, spike. There's a huge apex there. And the other thing that I'll add to what you've said, which is all brilliant is that it also having a high insulin environment is also going to affect luteinizing hormone as well, which is also involved in that follicular release. And you need to have a huge differentiation like LH. I always call LH like the uncle that like kind of comes in at Christmas, like comes in like a whirlwind hits you on the back, you know, like, Hey Steph, how's it going? And then like leaves, right. You don't see, you don't see LH at all, all year round, except for that one little window, <laughs> right. That's kind of how I, when I'm That's trying a to good like description, how do you think about it? That's how I think of luteinizing hormone. And if luteinizing, luteinizing hormone is always high, the differential, like the difference between it going from almost zero to its own apex is also going to affect the follicle's ability to release the egg ahead of, or, or just the ability to release the, the egg. And insulin also, like you said this with, um, when you have poor aromatization from te your testosterones to your um, estrogens, you're like the sex hormone blinding globulin is inversely related to insulin, right? So mm. as insulin goes up, SHBG goes down and that's going to allow for more testosterones to kind of have their, you know, masculinizing effects, um, on, on the female body. So I love, I love what you're saying. Um, let's, let's talk about the guys because we have, yeah. there are, uh, how can we support our men? So, you know, ED or erectile dysfunction is something that I think there's a lot of, even with PCOS, there's a lot of shame around it. Uh, it's not talked about and let's maybe give some a, a physiological mechanisms or an explanation for how being insulin resistant is going to affect blood flow is going to affect, mm -hmm. um, uh, the ability to uh, have and maintain a, an erection. Yeah, yeah. It, this is certainly a, a, a relevant topic. And in fact, the, the relevance of this is quite, uh, but, but profound to the point that there is, there is a manuscript. I can't, I can't cite the exact title, but it's something like, is insulin resistance the earliest manifest, or is erectile dysfunction the earliest manifestation of insulin resistance in men? So just suggesting how profound this connection is and how sensitive an erection might be to that phenomenon. Basically, normal male anatomy requires dramatic changes in blood flow. In other words, this process of rapidly dilating blood vessels or not when not needed. And insulin resistance, um, at those blood vessels will compromise the dilation. So, so briefly, and this is something that can happen systemically, so, so uh, anywhere kind of maybe outside of the brain, those blood vessels become insulin resistant. And insulin is attempting to induce vasodilation by increasing the production of a molecule called nitric oxide. And insulin does that very well normally, but the blood vessels can become resistant to that effect. And so insulin has come to the blood vessel walls, including in the instance of an erection, attempting to induce the production of nitric oxide, which would vasodilate, resulting in enhanced blood flow. It fails to happen in the case of insulin resistance. And so once again, I think there's something so relevant there. If a, if a, if a guy is hearing this or a gal is hearing this and thinking about a guy and, uh, and seeing this problem, don't expect a pill or, or, or rather don't hope that a pill is going to fundamentally treat the problem because an erect, erectile dysfunction is not a disease of an absence of Viagra. It's not like a Viagra deficiency is causing this man's erectile dysfunction. Find the more fundamental cause that a drug can never hope to solve. And, and namely in this case, insulin resistance will likely be waiting there to be found. And the upside of addressing whether it's the gal with PCOS or the guy with erectile dysfunction, the nice outcome 
will of course be improving those disorders by lowering insulin. And then the secondary outcomes will be wonderful as well, namely improved blood pressure, losing fat, um, perhaps greater mental clarity and on and on and on. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the insulin to glucagon ratio. Um, you talk about this in the book. I thought this was great. Uh, you know, we've defined, we've defined insulin generally, uh, as I, I like to think of insulin as like a hoarder, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like they want to take in all the substrates, put them in the cell, and then they want to defend, right? Like they don't, they never want to yep. clean up their closet. They always want to keep. Well said. Yeah. Glucagon for me. Uh, and this is like, you're going to laugh at all my analogies, but I feel like this is like glucagon is like, you just give someone an empty credit card and you're like, go and spend it, baby. <laughs> you know, it's like you go and spend the, like the, you know, the glucose, the glycogen, you can go spend the fatty acids. Um, I would love for you to talk about the influence or the, the opposing effects that glucagon has and why understanding this ratio is important. Yeah, so the ins insulin is the hormone of the fed state, if you will. Your analogy is perfect. If insulin is elevated, the body wants to keep stuff. And insulin will be elevated after we've eaten um, based on a typical higher carbohydrate meal or even a mixed macronutrient meal. Someone eating is eating a hamburger that's got fat, that's got carbs, it's got protein. Someone eats a hamburger, insulin will go up. That is the hormone of the fed state. In contrast, glucagon is the prototypical hormone of the fasted state. And so I, when I first started describing the insulin to glucagon ratio, I was actually doing so by relying on data from decades ago by, by scientists that I consider legendary, um, like George Cahill and Roger Unger, they would talk about this insulin to glucagon ratio. So I completely stole that discussion from them. It was not my um, new idea at all, but I was delighted to bring attention to it if for, for no other reason than to bring attention to their work. But basically, if we look at the balance of those two hormones, we're getting a, uh, an understanding of whether we are to take, to rely on one of your analogies, adding money to the account or drawing, withdrawing from the account. And insulin is gonna be storage, promoting storage. Glucagon will be promoting use. Of course, for healthy function, we must have periods of growth and we must have periods of breaking down, breaking things down, like the process of autophagy, for example. In fact, autophagy is maybe the most, the prototypical um, cellular process that would, you know, that someone might appreciate whether it's promoting longevity or not. We need to have times where we're building the cell up, we're allowing the cell to build things and make new parts of itself. And we need times where it can clean house, get rid of the stuff that's getting old, for example, and be prepared to build things back up again. So the balance of insulin and glucagon, I like to emphasize because it's not accurate. I don't think it's wholly, as much as I love pointing the finger at insulin, um, I think to overlook glucagon in the room of nutrients um, like the food we eat, I think it's not quite, um, it's not quite nuanced enough. And when I first, when I first started talking about the insulin to glucagon ratio, I did so in the context of protein, because I was hearing when I first became familiar with the low carb community, not the low carb science, but the low carb community, I was struck to hear people talking about, um, avoiding protein. Don't eat protein. It will kick you out of ketosis because it spikes insulin. And I thought, uh, and, and in, in contrast, they would say, just eat more fat, eat more fat. And that to me was a very odd um, mechanism or an odd pattern of eating. I'm certainly an advocate of fat, but eating just fat was very odd to me. And, and I thought if someone's doing that because they're afraid of protein, we've gotten something very wrong. And so I wanted to point the finger at the fact that yes, protein can increase insulin, but it also increases glucagon indeed potentially in a way that ultimately the, the increase in insulin is less relatively than the increase in glucagon. So ultimately creating a lower insulin to glucagon ratio, which would overall facilitate the use of fat, the production of ketones and the activation of autophagy, you know, these, these, maybe this trifecta of, of a desired metabolic outcome. And uh, so, uh, nevertheless, so protein represents a perfect example or a, a lens through which to see the value of the insulin to glucagon ratio. And again, to sum it up, it's just simply a more nuanced approach saying that if we see a bump in insulin, that might not be the problem that people think it is. 
uh, is, you know, with regards to say fat production um, or, or, or fat, you know, the regulation of fat cells that we really need to look at this other, what's on the other end of the seesaw and see what's happened to glucagon. Right. And, and I think when you consider this ratio, you can, you know, whether you are in, uh, if your insulin is higher than your glucagon, you can, you know, maybe deduce that when you take protein in that there will be a larger insulin spike based on that versus the flip side of that, when glucagon is higher, like when we are in maybe a fasted state or low carbohydrate diet, um, that there may, you're not going to have that same kind of spike. And I think that there's been a lot of confusion to your point in whether it's a key, like across the board, I've had, we had a a conversation, I was saying to you in the pre-chat with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Leon, Gabriel Leon, who's a friend of mine, uh, very much a protein uh, advocate. I mean, even just look at the, like protos is like, you know, pro protos means first, like it's the, it's the building block of all cells. Um, but there are many scientists, um, Dr. Walter Longo would be one, uh, where we look at blue zones and he's, he studied blue zones and he'll say, well, the key, you know, part of the reason why these people live to, you know, their centenarians and super centenarians is this idea of protein restriction or the, or the other argument that I hear is that it activates mTOR, the mammalian, uh, Mm -hmm. mammalian, uh, target of rapamycin. So I think that. And I love that you just said that there has to be periods of growth and, and repair, because when we talk about protein, you know, we can extend this conversation to muscle building or skeletal, uh, health, Mm -hmm. or, you know, you, there always has to be breakdown. Like with the, we have osteoblasts, which build up our bones and osteoclasts, which break them down. If you only had one, you're going to end up with a tumor. (laughs) Like if you only have blasts, osteoblasts, you're going to end up with a tumor. If you only have osteoclasts, you're going to end up with osteoporosis. You need to have the balance of the two. And the same is true for muscle growth. You know, if you want to have, and we're going to talk, I want to kind of move into how we can improve our insulin resistance resistance training, arguably one of the best ways that you can improve the sensitivity uh, of your cells to uh, insulin, you need to break down, you need to shred the muscles and then you got to give them time to repair, right? So you got to be, you know, mTOR is guns to be activated, you know, like it's going to happen. That's absolutely right. You have to have that cycle. So with, I very much oppose the sentiment that protein is an inducer of aging because of its activation of mTOR. So first of all, there was a recently published study challenging the validity of any of the conclusions from Blue Zone diets and actually pointing the finger at poor record keeping in these countries where people were wrong about their birth date, that in some instances were lying about their birth date in order to um, exploit government benefits and retirement. So uh, that's the first thing, that there is legitimate a legitimate challenge to what we think blue zones, blue zones really are. And it could simply be uh, people fudging the books or cooking the books, but be that as it may, um, th- the focus has um, shifted to mTOR because mTOR is a protein that will, stim- will basically block autophagy because it only wants the cell to be growing, which will in rodent models and in insect models like fruit flies, the evidence does indeed suggest that if you can tap down mTOR, the animal will live longer. And because dietary protein does acutely stimulate mTOR up and down, um, people have thought, well, then let's avoid protein. There's one enormous problem, in fact, multiple, two, they'll say two conclusions. One, the data itself in humans don't support that conclusion, where even um, that same group, the Longo group, uh, and and I, I hate to kind of diss another scientist, so I, I do mean to say this with um, respect, but even he would admit that at the age of 65, we see this inverse relationship Correct. where at the age of 65, people that are eating the least amount of protein have the highest mortality. Well, to me and my perhaps naive, ignorant mind, that blows the whole idea apart. If you look at people that are 65, let's, let's admit that's not that old. After the age of 65, the people eating the most protein are the more robust, longer lived. Well, then that to me challenges the whole idea that the whole paradigm that it's protein, which is activating mTOR, which is promoting longevity, that seems to blow that apart. But coming back to the mTOR idea, if mTOR is relevant, then I would say 
what is resulting in the incessant chronic activation of mTOR, and it comes back to insulin. Insulin activates mTOR higher than protein. Even leucine, the most anabolic of all amino acids, does not activate mTOR as much as insulin does. And that is so relevant, I contend, because we have given people this asinine advice to eat six meals a day and that carbohydrates should be the bulk of all of that food. And so the person wakes up and finally overnight their insulin has come down. And what do they do? They eat two bowls of cereal or a bagel or you know even worse potentially. And it spikes up their insulin dramatically. And it starts to take, it starts to come down around two hours or so. And of course they have to have a mid-morning snack which bumps it back up. Then it's lunchtime and on and on throughout the day where every waking moment and even into the night is spent in a state of elevated insulin and insulin is pushing the gas pedal on mTOR. It's not the protein, which will have a transient increase in mTOR and down and thank heavens that it does because to your point earlier, we need that anabolic boost. We need that anabolic stimulus. Otherwise we'd have no lean mass whatsoever or anything indeed. So uh, we cannot look at mTOR as a villain, just like we can't look at insulin as nothing but a villain. And I don't, I don't try to, or I don't want someone to think that I'm saying that. But nevertheless, if mTOR is a key variable in aging, and there's no evidence in humans to support that, but it's probably true. We just can't really do aging studies in humans um, very well, and, and, or at all perhaps. But if mTOR is the culprit, then all the more reason to keep the focus on insulin, not protein. Because if for no other reason, we need amino acids. There are such things as essential amino acids. We must eat them to survive. The insulin spiking carbohydrates, they may be wonderful and they can be certainly a part of a healthy diet, but they are not essential. There's nothing essential about dietary carbohydrates. So why have that be the basis or the foundation of our diet? I think it's, it's foolish. I agree. And, and I also think that you, the environment in which you consume the protein is also important as well. Like if you are in a, let's say mildly fasted, or you're, you're eating a low carbohydrate or carbohydrate appropriate diet, you are not going to have the same insulin spike as if you would, if you were, if you, there was, if you were already having a very high carbohydrate bolus and you're going right. to, you know, you're inhibiting gluconeogenesis and all of those things. So uh, agreed yeah, on all right. counts there. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, so we've been kind of dancing around diet. Uh, let's talk about some dietary considerations, uh, and even just dietary lifestyle considerations for improving, uh, insulin sensitivity. Um, I'm assuming that you, given our discussion, I'm assuming that you favor low carbohydrate, uh, but I would yeah. love for you to tell me, you know, what are, if we can just, from a chemical perspective, from a dietary perspective, what are some things, if someone's listening and they're like, okay, I'm kind of getting headaches. Maybe I got some skin tags going on, you know, uh, maybe I'm of Asian descent or, you know, Hispanic mm -hmm. descent where we know that these people are much more susceptible to um, IR. What are some things that they can be doing to uh, improve their diet? Yeah, yeah. So, so f the easy answer is you can anything you do to get off the standard American diet, which isn't fair to the U.S. because it's all over the world now. Yes. And I say that with authority, having you know traveled. Um, so let's just call it the global diet uh, yeah. to be more yeah. accurate at this point. Uh, you do anything, even even a low fat, you know, plant based diet is going to improve your insulin sensitivity compared with where you started. I will absolutely state that because there's evidence to support it. However, we have to take that one step further and say, well, what happens if we compare a low fat diet to a low carbohydrate diet? And there is a clear, clear winner, which is the only reason I'm an advocate of a low carbohydrate diet. I wouldn't do it if I did not believe that the sum of all available clinical human data supported it. A low carbohydrate diet wins when it comes to improving insulin sensitivity. And I believe there are four fundamental pillars that a smart low carbohydrate diet or, or insulin sensitizing diet is built on. And the first one is control carbohydrates, focus on fruits and vegetables and put grains in their place, you know, much, much less, eat less, much less of them. And of course, sugary foods, even, you know, a rung lower than that. So control carbohydrates. And the easiest way to do that is don't get your carbohydrates from a bag or a box with a barcode on it focus on real foods, and that is going to be fruits and vegetables. And in general, if you're just doing that, it's great. We, we often don't even need to go beyond that, although we could certainly go further. But that's the easiest definition of it or application of it, I think. Second is prioritize protein. Make sure you're getting enough protein. Protein 
um, induces satiety. It'll help you control your appetite. And of course it's essential, but focus on animal source proteins because by every objective measurement, animal source proteins outperform plant-based proteins. If someone is attempting to get all their proteins from plant sources, they will have a very hard time um, and they will be getting things they don't want, like anti-nutrients, like phytic acids and tannins and trypsin inhibitors, which inherently come with plant-based proteins. And they may be getting things that are even worse, like toxic levels of lead and arsenic, which can get enriched in these plant proteins because plants don't give proteins very well. And so it requires a high degree of industrialization to get them. So focus on dairy, eggs, and meat for your proteins. And so that's number two, prioritize protein. Third, pillar in my mind is fill with fat and any remaining kind of calories that your body is seeking, get it, get, get it from fat. And, and first of all, let that fat come with the protein because nature has those best protein sources always coming with fat. Take it that way. Don't dump out those egg yolks. That egg yolk is supposed to come with the egg white. Eat it that way. It's actually more anabolic at muscle anyway than the egg whites alone. So let the fat come with the protein how it wants to. And don't be afraid of adding fat to those meals in the form of animal fats and fruit fats. And the fruit fats are the coconuts, avocados, olives, where you're getting fruit just from the flesh, or you're getting fat from the flesh of the fruit, where our ancestors, we would have been able to do this for thousands of years. We simply would have scooped out the flesh or just gotten the olives and pitted them. And then you're just stepping on them or pressing them. And it gives you oil, unlike these seeds, like canola seeds or soybean, where you need all this industrialization to get it, which is why they're such novel fats. Avoid those fats, focus on the ancestral fats and, and that coming from animal source and plant uh, and, and fruit, the, the, uh, the fruit fats. And then the fourth pillar, fast, intermittent fasting. That's it. I'll just leave it at that because there's numerous ways to do that, but there's no question it can be very, very effective at improving insulin sensitivity. I love that. And I, and I love and w w when we talk to, you know, when I talk to vegans and vegetarians and I'm saying this to you in the pre-chat, they tend to be women. Not that there's not men who do this, but I find that there's more of a drive um, to go vegan or to do vegetarianism uh, in, in the female population. And often they will say, well, I feel like ethically, you know, the way that the animals are raised and killed in conventional farming. And, you know, they're, they're not wrong. Like they, it is, mm -hmm. You know, and we can have, you know, regenerative agriculture where we have, you know, the cows and the chickens are grazing the way that, you know, mother nature wanted. I think that we can get a better quality of meat, but you have to be almost a scientist to get veganism, right? Because you need to be, know how to comp combine your protein so that you're getting all the array of essential amino acids. Every woman that I have ever worked with, and I, I say this with love, it's like you are vitamin B12 deficient until proven otherwise. And it is often the case that there are a multitude of Bs that are missing. So the B6, the B9, the, the B12s, uh, they will often mm -hmm. have a lot of um, digestive issues because they have this fermentation of the excess plants. Yep. And it's, you know, they also eat like a lot of processed foods. Like they're, I can't remember the name of it. I'm trying to, remember. it's like this plant burger that bleeds. I don't know if you've seen this. It's like, it looks supposed oh, to look Oh, I know like exactly what you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it, but like, what is that? That is a Franken food. That is not yep. a real thing. You know, plant, like peas don't bleed. You know what I'm saying? No, no, um, no, that's right. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. I 100% I agree with everything you're saying. I love it. I often will say that veganism is a privilege of the elite. You have to be educated enough to know what you are deficient in because you will be deficient in right. nutrients. Uh, in, in, including uh, the B vitamins, like you mentioned, giving rise to a pernicious anemia, which is, can certainly be lethal, and or an iron deficiency anemia, because you cannot get iron from plants in the form you need. So you will have those two very likely, and you will be miserable and weak and lethargic. Um, but also, why it's a privilege of the elite, in addition to knowing what you're deficient in, you have to be wealthy enough to afford the supplements to make up for it. Right. But all of this can be completely resolved by just eating some beef for example. And so when I see young undergraduate, you know, students and they, they say, oh, Dr. Bickman, I'm sorry, I'm falling asleep in class. I just haven't gotten my iron dose right. And I vividly remember this conversation. And, and of course I knew immediately, oh, well, she's vegan. And I said, well, you could just eat some beef, eat some hamburger and the problem will go away. But of course there's this 
this, this, whatever it is, this mental block in some people's minds or this, this genuine, you know, sort of aching for animal death. But even then there's a myth of veganism, a paper published from Australia exploring the actual number of deaths that, uh, that are a result of ranching practices versus farming, you know, like coming in and stripping a land and making it grow all the peas and the soybeans that the vegans need for their protein and their fake hamburgers. That process of farming kills multiples more animals, um, you know, yeah. ground dwelling birds and squirrels and, and gophers, et cetera. Rabbits and yeah. And the yep, that's it. That, that's exactly right. Yep. Right. So there is a, there's a myth to that even that gets propagated in that, in that plant-based community that it's a, a more moral way. And I think even there, that is not correct. Right. So if someone's listening and they're like, okay, maybe I got some of these, you know, maybe my parents were, you know, I, my mom had PCOS or whatever it is, and they wanted to get a lab workup and they said, okay, I want to, I want to understand my physiology. What would be some lab tests that you would like to see monitored over time? And at what frequency would you like to see them so that we can sort of monitor and gauge whether or not someone is improving or, or not? Yeah, yeah. So I would say there are two. Um, one that would be uh, harder to get, perhaps, but maybe better, and then one that's easier. And so it has value just by that, by nature of that. So the first one would just be getting your fasting insulin measured. And now I, I say that can be a hard one to get because depending on where the person is, it might not even be an option. Um, for example, in in places, you know, pluses and minuses, and I do not at all intend to in, uh, get political here, where it is a more socialized healthcare system, it will be much harder to get insulin measured. Like in the UK with the National Health Service, that's, that's, it's very difficult to get that measured. Even in Canada, Canada, you know, Canada my, is hard my too, family, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm from Alberta, a native Canadian. Hmm. Um, it, that's difficult to get um, because it's simply not covered. And, and I get it. That's an additional expense that the state has to cover or the province in that case, the government needs to cover. Um, but nevertheless, if someone can get it measured, get your fasting insulin measured. And in the in, in the U.S. empirical units, if it's six micro units per mil or lower, I consider that a slam dunk. And then in the molar units, like in Canada, if it's a, I think that correlates to around thirty to thirty-five picomoles. If it's less than that, then you're doing good. That's a green light. You're very likely insulin sensitive. Now, the drawback is, however, with insulin that, like every hormone, it has its own rhythm. And it is possible that a person gets their blood test and they're happy, they're, they happen to catch it at a higher point. And so if they've measured their, um, their blood and it's higher, their insulin and it's higher than the range I'm saying, but perhaps close to it, now all the more reason to rely on the second marker, which in some instances may be the only one a person can get, but it still has value. And that is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. So take your triglycerides, divide it by your HDL cholesterol. And if that number is... 1.5 or less, once again, that's a good sign that you're insulin sensitive. So those are two blood markers. One, admittedly easier to get because we always check blood lipids, but regardless, if you can get either or both of them, you can get a really solid idea of where you're at. Would you ever look at, so I will often do like a postprandial glucose challenge. So I know mm. that glucose is not the, you know, is not the, the ball, the bell of the ball here, but would you, if it's, if it's available, like to look at someone preprandial, pre-meal, and then maybe two hours, uh, you know, after a meal, would you want to look at that as well? Is that something that might be useful? Oh yeah, most certainly. Yeah. Although I, I wish I could remember the cutoffs a little better. I think that, um, if if the if it hasn't returned almost to where it started at around two hours or so, that's that's a that's not a good sign. Uh, it's a sign that there might be something wrong. And I think if the peak gets to around like 180 or so, mind you, that is based on like one quantified like a 50 gram glucose solution or so. Um, then that's also a warning sign. But don't take me uh, don't take those too far. I don't I'm not I cannot exactly remember those numbers, but it's around there. This is, this has been such a useful conversation. I think that this is going to help so many people and the book, uh, in case, uh, you missed it, it's called why we get sick. And it is just, I have to say, I said this to you in the pre-chat, I'll say it to you now. It is a phenomenal book. I have highlights. I have pen, like it's all marked That's up. It's, just, it's a great book. I congratulations on it. And I know that this conversation is really going to help our, our listeners in terms of getting their insulin uh, resistance, if it's there or improving their insulin sensitization over time. So I just wanted to thank you for this conversation. Oh, my, my pleasure. I think we covered some really great topics. 
Thank you. Dr. Stephen Gundry is the video that's coming up next for you. Just click right here. We're talking about the microbiome, energy, postbiotics, mitochondria, and how to get your energy back. Continuous ketosis, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is really dumb. 